President Trump made clear and Netanyahu made clear that they were friends. But let it be understood that Joe Biden has also been a great friend of Israel. But maybe it has to do with our own sense of what the future is. I want to step back for a moment and just reflect on one other thing. How important is Israel to Jews in America today? After the 67 war, and by the way, I, I want to quickly tell you the story. Uh, I come from an assimilated family here in San Francisco. Uh, we celebrated Christmas and Easter. I had no particular attachment to Israel, although my father was a refugee from Nazi Germany, and I was aware of Israel. When I had my bar mitzvah, I got a book about Israel. I returned it. What mobilized Jews in America in support of Israel was the Six-Day War. I will never forget sitting with a group of friends watching television during the Six-Day War, and one of my friends turned to me as the Arab masses ran through the streets of Damascus and Cairo shouting death to the Jews, one of my friends turned to me and said, hey, John, they're talking about you. And so if you are of a certain age, you remember what it was like and the feeling that Israel could be destroyed. There was a novel that was written some years ago called If Israel Lost the War. I know it's in your library at the center. I pull it out periodically from my own library and use it to remind myself of the fear that gripped Jews in America about a second Holocaust. And I remember Golda Meir and Menachem Begin, who disagreed on almost everything, striking that same theme of the survival of Israel, the whole point of we are one. What I learned in this last presidential election in the United States is that the divisions in the Jewish community in America are growing in part because those of us who are 50 years of age and older remember the Holocaust, even if we were not alive during those terrible days. But we also remember the Six Day War. We remember the Yom Kippur War. We remember Entebbe. We even remember the hope when Yitzhak Rabin shook hands with Yasser Arafat. These are vivid memories for us. But when I speak now on college campuses, the whole tone is different because there is no memory of those days. So one of the things that we need to bear in mind is when Donald Trump spoke to the Jewish community, he was speaking, uh, speaking to those who were over a certain age and to the Orthodox community. When Joe Biden speaks, he speaks to a different constituency because the younger Jews do not have that sense of history, rightly or wrongly. I'm not here to cast blame, but think about Orange County. Think about what the attitudes have been. I lived in Whittier uh, from 1967 to 1973. And I ran the Chabarat Noar program. I helped create the Chabarat Noar program, which became in Orange County the Adat Noar program, which was run by many years by the Bureau. I came down every, every year to speak to them, kids. The attitudes changed. The approach of the Jewish community changed. One other example, for those of you involved in Federation, once upon a time, Federation raised money not for domestic Jewish concerns like Jewish education or JCC, money was raised for Israel. And part of the money raised for Israel went for domestic concerns. And some of you are old enough to remember when there was a great debate. Should we be siphoning off money raised for Israel's survival or for the absorption of Soviet Jews for domestic Jewish needs? Now, why do I raise this? Because it goes to the heart of the divisions which exist in our community. The arguments against Donald Trump, we all understand. But when it came to Israel, there is an understanding that Donald Trump fulfilled the expectations and the dreams of many. With Joe Biden, Joe Biden is not by any stretch, nor was Barack Obama an enemy, not by any stretch, but their position, their approach, 
was substantially different. Let me give you the best example I can. Donald Trump never said he opposed the two-state solution, but I will tell you he did, 100%. And I will tell you that Joe Biden favors a two-state solution, 100%, as did Barack Obama. So if you're using Israel as a barometer, there's your choice. And that shows the difference. It was no surprise to me that about 70% of Jews in America voted for Donald Trump. About 30% voted for Joe Biden. No surprise at all. And I could tell you when I would go out to speak before COVID and I would do a lot of personal appearances around the country that in the Orthodox community, Trump could do no wrong. I went to a wedding, my, uh, my great niece got married and she's in Arizona in Phoenix. And this was before COVID of course, and uh, there's no doubt that the family that she married into was solidly for Donald Trump. They're traditional Jews. They are devoted to Israel. The Holocaust played a central role and the struggle for Soviet Jewry played a central role. And in their mind, Donald Trump was the best. Now you could raise all the arguments against Donald Trump and their argument would be, but look, look what he's done for the Jewish people. Look what he's done for the state of Israel. Joe Biden has a history, but it's a history which is mixed with the perception, not the reality, that Barack Obama was anti-Israel. Nothing could be further from the truth. My, my wife has a cousin whose husband is very high in the Israeli uh, intelligence community, uh, who, when I visited in Israel several years ago, made it a point to tell me, Barack Obama was one of the best friends Israel ever had in terms of sharing intelligence. But I often say on my own radio program, don't confuse people with the facts. So where does that leave us as a community? The first and most important thing is we all must understand the centrality of Israel in our lives. The thought of Israel not existing, can you imagine? what the implications would be for our own Jewish identity. Israel winning the Six Day War reinvigorated the JCCs, reinvigorated Jewish education, gave a real boost to Jewish day schools and Jewish summer camps. Uh, the emergence of Soviet Jewry. Think about the number of Jews who we campaigned for, fought for. I led all the demonstrations in San Francisco in front of the Soviet consulate. We had a Soviet consulate here. And remember the chant, one, two, three, four, open up the iron door. Five, six, seven, eight, let our people emigrate. Uh, I remember those days. I remember hosting Natan Sharansky, my old friend, when he finally got out and we had a rally here in San Francisco in front of the Soviet consulate. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people showed up because there was a feeling of solidarity, a feeling that we had achieved something. I say this because I want you to understand, first of all, that I question now whether or not Jews in America have the same commitment to the centrality of Israel that we did in the post Six Day War period. Number two, there is, and I say this advisedly, a tremendous ignorance among Jews in America about issues, about what's going on in Israel. If I were here today to talk about the upcoming Israeli election, and I pointed out to you that in Israel there is vigorous dissent, people who love Netanyahu, people who hate Netanyahu, people who lean to the left, people who lean to the right, most Jews in America are not aware of the divisions that exist in Israeli society. And when it comes to Jews in American politics, there seems to be on the part of some, both Democrats and Republicans, a need to demonize the other. Let me be clear. I don't care if you're on the left or on the right. If you support Israel's right to exist in peace and security, that's great. I've spoken before APAC innumerable times, as many of you know, but I've also had the opportunity to speak before 
uh, more left-wing uh, pro-Zionist groups. And I don't mind at all. When I was in charge of secondary Jewish education in Los Angeles, I didn't mind whether it was Hashomer Hatzair or Beitar who asked me to speak. As long as Hashomer being on the left and uh, Beitar being on the right, as long as there was that common point of consensus. So I, I don't want to go on too long and I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Just to point out to you, we cannot let the Jewish community in America be polarized over the question of who is the most pro-Israel. We must abide by the conviction that as a people, we must be unified in our effort uh, to convey Israel's mission and message. And that means we, as a Jewish community, can disagree. We can argue. It's fine. That's what they do in Israel. But we must never lose sight of the fact that even though many of us were opposed to Donald Trump, he was a great friend of Israel who accomplished things that Jews in America had wished for for years. And Joe Biden and his record should never be dismissed. We had a great friend when he was in the Senate and when he was vice president and now that he's president. There will be policy differences. There will be issues about, well, Iran, Jewish settlements, uh, the future of the Jewish relationship between Jews in Israel and Jews in America. I don't mind all of the contention, but what I mind is when it becomes negative. We must be positive. Let me conclude with this thought. We are a blessed generation. We live in a world in which there is an Israel. For the first time in 2000 years, we as Jews have a choice whether to live in the land of our birth or the land to which we immigrated, or to live in the land of Israel. That is the ultimate fulfillment of the Zionist dream, to give Jews choice. Louis Brandeis summed it up when he said that all we ask is that we have the same right as every other people in the world, the right of choice. The choice to live in the land of our birth or to live in the land of Israel. The thought that there would ever be a world in which there would be no Israel, in which the renaissance of Jewish education, Jewish camping, Hebrew, spoken Hebrew, the whole idea of what we have seen since the end of the Second World War, we must not allow internal division or debate over a candidate for president uh, to separate us. When Joe Biden and Donald Trump are long gone, the Jewish people will still be here. Israel will still be here. Our obligation to ensure the vitality and the centrality of Israel will still be here. And all of the issues we can debate all of the discussions we have. I was talking to uh, <clears throat> some rabbis the other day. The Israeli Supreme Court has ruled that reform and conservative Jews uh, can now become Israeli citizens under the law of return. The chief rabbinate will never accept reform and conservative conversion. But some of you in Southern California will remember a rabbi by the name of Pinky Dubin, who was the assistant at Sinai on Wilshire Boulevard. And in 1970, uh, Pinky led a group to Steboker, and they met David Ben-Gurion. And Pinky was an outspoken guy. And he said to Ben-Gurion, what are you going to do about recognizing reform and conservative Jews in Israel? Uh, and Ben-Gurion smiled and he said, Rabbi Dubin, bring me a million reform and conservative Jews to Israel and your problem will be solved. <laughs> and I think there is an element of truth. One last thing, and I know I said last, but, you know, uh, as a radio talk show host with no commercials, uh, I, I can't help myself. We are all one. We all are bound together. In the camps, they didn't ask whether you were a reformed Jew or conservative Jew, an Orthodox Jew. 
a Zionist, a non-Zionist, we were all Jews. And I am always conscious of the fact that whatever internal divisions we may have, we are one people. And uh, anyway, let me now stop. I appreciate my being able to talk about this with you. And now I welcome any and all questions. John? Yes. Hi, it, it's Spencer's father. Oh, this is the man who's, who's, whose son is dating my niece, so your family. Whatever. That's right, Miss Spr Spr I wouldn't miss your, your talk for, uh, for anything. I missed it last time when you were down here in Orange County and Spencer went to it and spoke about it. Yes, and, I did, uh, and I gave him permission in writing to marry yes. so it's we, okay, go ahead. We, we're, we're waiting for the day. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I enjoyed your talk, but I, I will have to tell you that I find that people who argue that Barack Obama, and I guess it has to do Biden, uh, I, I get criticism from some of my friends on the right who say, well, I know you love Israel, Jay, and you're very devoted to Israel, but I don't understand you how you can like Obama. I, I have problems with the right and polarizing the situation with Israel. And that brings me to the point that Donald Trump, in my opinion, was bad for the United States in general. And I know he did some things that uh, people feel that was good for Israel and you pointed, wisely pointed them out. But I still have a basic problem with the fact that I think that's where the polarization comes from. I welcome your comment. Polarization existed before Donald Trump. And before well, Joe Biden, even even before Donald Trump, but it's gotten worse under him. Of course it has, because Donald Trump is a polarizing figure. His whole campaign, his whole presidency, was based on dividing and conquering, and that that was his philosophy of governance. Uh, I have to tell you, that's the reason why I was not a Trump supporter, aside from all the issues domestically with which I disagreed with him, but. The question of, 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 of an Obama, let me tell you what happened. The demonization of Barack Obama, the notion that Barack Obama was in his kishkes, anti-Israel, was pure rubbish. If we were debating the question of the future of Israel, and we could, I would insist that there be two sides represented. One with the Obama a Biden position in general versus the Trump position. It's the polarization within the political Zionist community, which has always existed. The battle between labor Zionism and revisionist Zionism. It, it's just that simple. But what's happened now is it's become a domestic American Jewish political problem. And that's what I'm upset about. But when I express my views on Israel, which I'm happy to do, I know that in the end, it will be the Israelis who in just a few weeks will go to the polls and vote on what they want. And they have their own country and it's their determination. So I understand exactly what you're saying. And Thank that's you. part of where we are as Jews in America. Yeah. Can, I, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Um, so I thought you encapsulated everything really, really well in terms of everything you covered but I've always been so frustrated for a million years in the difference between the right and left and what that really means in this country versus Israel okay. it's like it's like Completely. it's like a night and day the left on the, in this country has no idea about kibbutzim and the history of you know kibbutzim and and all that um it's been so frustrating for me and it's always been a little bit different so where do you go from here okay. you know First of all, the left in the United States and the right in the United States are very different than the left and right in Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If you invited me today to talk about the Israeli election in two weeks, I would be happy to expound on the differences between the left and the right in Israel. <laughs> but the point is that in the United States, what unified us was that we were not left or right on Israel. We were committed to one thing, right. the survival of Israel. Well. I want to tell you that short of the danger of Iran, which I believe is an existential threat, there is no threat to Israel's survival. 
they could be defeated in a nuclear attack. There may be arguments inside of Israel, but Israel itself is an established society. And one of the greatest things that has happened, and more power to Donald Trump and Jared Kushner, was the Abrahamic Accords. I mean, no matter what you think about Trump, imagine the celebration. Look, I remember when Sadat came to Jerusalem. And if you had asked me who would come first to Yerushalayim, the Mashiach or Anwar Sadat, I would have put my money on the Mashiach. If you had asked me for years whether I could have imagined the Gulf states making not a peace treaty, it's not a peace treaty because they were never at war with Israel, but opening up this kind of, uh, of detente, if you will, it's astounding. And let me tell you what's frustrating for the Arab world is this makes Israel more secure. Now, I have many priorities. Want to talk about separation of church and state? Want to talk about uh, uh, the Republican agenda on a woman's right to choose? Well, I mean, I can go down the list uh, on whether there's global warming or not. Uh, there goes your dog scattering off. But do you, um, can you, you understand? I have real political differences with the Republican Party. And let me, let me be crystal clear. I was a Republican for many years. I was president of the Teenage Republicans. I was the youngest member of the Republican State Central Committee. I was on Richard Nixon's staff. I'm Harold Stassen's biographer. You can pick up Richard Norton Smith's book on Thomas E. Dewey, and he calls me a scholar of modern republicanism. You can pick up Stanley Hilton's book on Bob Dole, a scholar of the Republican Party. I mean, my roots in the Republican Party are deep, but I left the Republican Party because I could not abide their domestic policy. Now, for those of you who are Republicans or Trump supporters, that's the other thing that bothers me. I have never pledged my allegiance to one man. The one person who I believed in and who was my friend and for whom I worked for many years was Richard Nixon. I went to Whittier College. I have the same professors Nixon had. When I had them, they were very old. When he had them, they were very young. I worked for Richard Nixon and I believed in Richard Nixon, but when I felt betrayed, I had no problem uh, leaving Richard Nixon. And in fact, much to the shock of many of my friends, I supported George McGovern in 1972, not to go back in history, but there needs to be some courage. I, I don't wanna talk American politics, but I will say this. What happened on January 6th in our nation's capital shook me to my core. And those of you who heard me on the radio know that during the height of the riot, I said, Donald Trump, where are you? Pick up the phone, make the phone call, stop the people who support you. And he didn't do it. So I have to bifurcate in my mind, and I hope we all do it. I think Donald Trump is the worst president in American history. I don't make any bones about it. James Buchanan becomes almost a saint compared to Donald Trump. But if you ask me whether Donald Trump was a great friend of Israel, the answer is yes. He did the things that Israeli governments left and right wanted. And he did it clearly and precisely. So if you were listening to me in the hope that I would come on and state all the negatives, I could have. But do you understand? We need to be rise above it to a degree and allow the consensus. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. We're going to sit down at our Seder tables, uh, tables the Shana Haba Ab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Now we can say, the Shana Hazot Yerushalayim, this year in Jerusalem. And for me, that has incredible resonance. So when I go to the Lovers of Zion Museum in Jerusalem, and one day they have a statue of Donald Trump. I may not be happy to see Donald Trump at all, but Donald Trump earned that recognition. And by the way, did you notice that debate about Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, even substantially the question of Jewish settlement have now receded. They have become acceptable in the mainstream. Joe Biden has announced the embassy will remain in Jerusalem.
I can't begin to tell you what that means for those of us who care deeply about Israel. Anyway, I hope I answered your question. We have a number of uh, comments in the chat that I'd like to get to. Julie, do you want to take that? Yeah, um, there's one, maybe you can help me. Uh, I don't, it says in US, the complexity involves the intersectionality of being a constant context. Could it be that there needs to be more orientation towards developing solidarity that maintains our history and becomes symbiotic with evolving democratic systems? Yes, absolutely. Israel is the great democracy in the Middle East. By the way, not a perfect democracy. Take a look at the infighting going on now in Israeli political circles. What, you know, is Netanyahu a true democratic leader? You know, he's a man who's, who's under indictment, <laughs> matter who may go to jail. I mean, there are all of these issues, but I can tell you, my son, our son, made Aliyah uh, six, seven years ago. He can't wait for the Israeli election. And by the way, he doesn't vote the way I would like him to vote because I raised him to think for himself. And what I guess I'm really appealing for is that Jews in America are more aware so we can think for ourselves. So when we sit down and debate these issues, we can do it with a modicum of intelligence. And by the way, being able to see both sides, we tend to put things in, in one dimension. We can't do that. That's why Donald Trump becomes an enigma. As by the way, let me remind you, Menachem Begin was an enigma for Jews in America. Do you remember Time Magazine, their cover story when Begin was elected, the caption was, Begin rhymes with Fagin. And they predicted that within a year, the Middle East would erupt in war. Well, look what happened. Begin won the Nobel Peace Prize. It is the eternal contradictions and hope. And that's what I have. What is the national anthem of the Jewish people? Hatikva, the hope, I believe. Okay, next question. Well, oh, there's a question in uh, the chat, the kind of the impossible question that we um, as Jews seem to have to um, balance every, um, every election. But if we have to choose between the best president for Israel or the, um, or the worst president for the US, how is that choice made? I must tell you, I think Jews in America vote our interests, just like African-Americans or Hispanics or Asians. And within our community, there are divisions. Look how the vote turned out. 70% for Biden, 30% for Trump. I would tell you that Jews in America weigh both. The most interesting thing to me is if a candidate for president were truly anti-Israel, I mean, really, anti-Israel, Jews in America wouldn't vote for him whether he was a Democrat or a Republican. Oh, some would, but most wouldn't. So I trust, and I'm gonna use this word advisedly, the discriminating tastes, discrimination of Jews in America who make a determination. Is there anybody listening to the sound of my voice who would vote for a candidate who was anti-Israel? You know the great thing about the last campaign? Israel wasn't an issue. There have been presidential campaigns where Israel was an issue. Carter versus Reagan, McGovern versus Nixon. There were real questions about where our concerns were. But let me say one other thing. There is no question in my mind that those who charge dual loyalty go back to a canard which doesn't exist. It is my right as a voter in the United States of America to vote on the issues I care about. One of the issues I care about is Israel. And so I have to make a determination. I was lucky in the late presidential campaign because I viewed Biden and Trump as equally pro-Israel. Different nuances, as I pointed out. But what if one of the candidates had been anti-Israel and I'd agreed with that candidate on everything else? I wouldn't have voted for him. And I would point out to you 
that that is how people make determinations in voting, uh, whether it has to do with the issue of immigration or the issue of the price of milk or well, any other issue. I'll never forget a uh, very prominent Jew in New York. He was a physician, now deceased, but I will spare you his name, who made an argument to me that he would never vote for a candidate who favored socialized medicine. Never, never do it. And uh, I raised the question with him about that because in the end, he had to make his determination as every American does. And so we have issues we care about and uh, that's the way it is. What about Kamala Harris? What observations do you have with her relationship with Israel? I've known Kamala, uh, I knew her before she was a candidate. The first radio show she ever appeared on was my radio program dealing with the question of uh, children sold into slavery, essentially. And she was phenomenal. She's pro-Israel. Does she lean to the left? Yes. But is she pro-Israel? Absolutely. Has she been to Israel? Yes. Has she spoken at Israel events? Absolutely. Has she condemned BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions? Absolutely. Publicly and with a determination. So I have a high regard for her personally. Uh, by the way, her husband is also active in the Jewish community in Southern California. And what are her stepchildren call her? Mamala. Kamala Mamala. You know? <laughs> but the point is, I believe that she, if she were to become president, and remember when you're vice president, you're a heartbeat away. Uh, I always remember John Kennedy's famous statement, I'm not worried about Lyndon Johnson, I'm young and I'm healthy and he'll never be president. You never know. But would I have faith that she would execute the duties well? The answer is yes, and I believe she is pro-Israel. Ask me about uh, some of the more radical left of the Democratic Party? And the answer is no, I would not be comfortable. But if you're a Republican, do you remember Pete McCloskey? Do you remember Republicans in this country who were anti-Israel, including Pat Buchanan? Each party has a fringe. My goal, and I always believe it's essential, is it was articulated by AIPAC years ago. Israel is not a partisan issue. We have to approach it on a bipartisan level. And let me answer the one question that then should be, well, AIPAC supports the current government of Israel. Let me remind you that AIPAC always has supported whoever was in power because AIPAC does not have a partisan political stand. It's neither pro Likud nor pro labor. Uh, it's, it's a lobby for Israel in the United States working with the Congress to benefit Israel. So I've, I've never, never really been concerned about that. Next question. Do you have any thoughts on how we get young people to appreciate and support Israel? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Because I ran secondary Jewish education in Los Angeles in the early 1970s. And because of my intense involvement, even in Orange County, with Adat Noir, a program which no longer exists, Kavrat Noar no longer exists. The Chalutz program no longer exists. Talkni Katsir no longer exists. It's a question of what we do in terms of Jewish education. As my grandmother would have said, where is your emphasis? And the emphasis on Israel has diminished. Why? It's a very good question. I believe very strongly, and I've when our son decided to make Aliyah, uh, I was somewhat surprised, although he comes from a home in which my wife was president of Adassa here in San Francisco, and my involvement in the Zionist movement from top to bottom over many years has been clear. But most of our children are not conditioned to know our history. What is the greatest single problem? You know, Golda Meir many years ago was asked what the biggest problem was about the survival of Israel. And she said, no, no, 
Don't speak to me about the survival of Israel. Talk to me about the survival of your children as Jews. I'm not going to get into the question of the intermarriage rate in this country. And many of you listening to the sound of my voice understand the issue. It is a question of our identity. And there is a great plus to the United States of America. You can disappear here. You can, at least to a point. But there is the converse that when we feel threatened, the Six Day War, the survival of Soviet Jews, all of a sudden we realize that we really are one. And when that sense of solidarity is lost, then our appreciation for what it is to be Jews, we're going to sit at our Seder table and we're going to say the words when we were slaves in the land of Israel. Not when they were slaves, but when we were slaves. And we need to understand our history and our culture. And may I tell you, the most important single thing for us is Jewish education. And how many of you want your children to be rabbis? Or how many of you want your children to make Jewish education a career? And forgive me, you have a new CEO at the Orange County JCC. How many of you want your child to grow up to be the director of the Jewish Community Center? Part of it has to do with our own direction. And if you ask me why there is a renewal of orthodoxy in America, or at least the Balchuba movement, the return movement, is because there is a greater awareness. And a lot of those people voted for Trump. Not all, but a lot of them felt that Trump addressed money for parochial education, support for Israel, condemnation of Iran, the real fear of Iran, and uh, I can't dispute that, that's, that's true. So Jewish education is a whole other thing in America. I have two more quick questions. I do have to mention, by the way, I'm an alumni of Adat Noir, thank you. Were you there when I was there? I was there mid eighties. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was there. Okay, go ahead. Um, we have a quick question about, ooh, I have to find it, but I think there was a question about Jewish federations. Do you happen to know, they think that about 50% of federation gifts still go to Israel? Can you confirm that? It, 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 it depends on the community in which you live, but I will tell you this, and I, 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 I'm not here to comment on these things, but I will anyway, because what am I got to lose? The worst you're going to do is turn me off. <laughs> Once upon a time, all monies raised went through the Federation. And every Jewish organization, including the JCCs, went to the Federations for support. That has stopped. So Federation influence, its impact, is vastly diminished no matter what community you go into. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's, it's a real question. Remember that the directors of federations were primarily uh, social workers uh, who may or may not have had great Jewish identity, or they were professionals. Uh, and uh, it's a whole different universe now in terms of the role of a federation. Uh, does the JCC in Orange County have a separate fundraising arm? Of course. That was not the case years ago. Do you remember those of you who are long time Orange County residents? Now, is it a good thing? Of course, I guess it's a good thing. But it means that the federations are no longer the central address of the Jewish community. Just isn't true. Uh, I can tell you, for instance, Jewish Family and Children's Services here in San Francisco, in my judgment, has a greater influence than the Federation. Now, some would argue, mm -hmm. Danny Grossman, who's the director of the Federation here, who I knew when he was a kid, he was one of my students, he might argue with me, but it's true. The, the need for a centralized fundraising has gone. It's vanished. Is that good or bad? Well, for the federations, it's not a good thing because they're no longer the central address. But that's just John Rothman speaking, which you may agree or disagree with. Uh, take a look at your own community. I, uh, I think that's it on the chat, but we might have time for one or two more questions. Take as many as you want. I have no place to go. Okay. This is COVID-19. <laughs> 
Did I catch everyone's questions who typed into the chat? If I missed it, feel free to shout it out. Um, so there was a question about Trump's, um, the catalyst to the things he did for Israel. Uh, typically, I guess it says he, um, who was he trying to please? Was he trying to please the evangelical Christians? Was he trying to please Jared Kushner? Was he trying to please APAC? Who was he doing that for? For everybody. Uh, Donald Trump is a, is a fascinating man. Do you remember when he was the head of the uh, Israel parade for, on Israeli Yom Hatzmaut in New York? And people wonder, what, what, what are we doing? Well, he gave a lot of money, so that was one of the reasons. But no, I think Donald Trump is motivated ideologically because of the people who he has contact with. Um, and I would say evangelical Christians are great friends of Israel. Whatever their motivation, they are great friends of Israel. When I speak to evangelical Christians, I get more amens and hallelujahs than I do from Jewish audiences. So it's, it's part of the reality and fabric. And when you have one third of the American people who are even over the age of 18, who are evangelical Christians, Israel becomes a central issue. They wanted Jerusalem to be the capital recognized by the United States. They believe in Jewish settlement in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank or the administered territories for all of the theological reasons which you all know. But that's the reality of the nation in which we live. And uh, they have as much right to vote as anybody else. Uh, I'll never forget Jerry Falwell of calling himself a Zionist. And there was a lot of upset in the Jewish community about that. But from his point of view, he was a committed Zionist. So uh, do I reject that? Why should I? Uh, we had also a comment about the Abraham Accords um, that you referenced. And it was, um, Sai suggested that they weren't started by Trump but there was some very warm relationships that existed with Trump. Do you want to say that? That is absolutely right. But let me point out to you, there were feelers between Israel and Egypt going back to uh, previous administration. Uh, no, no. In the end, what matters is when was it achieved? And whatever can be said about Donald Trump, that will be one of the major achievements of his administration from his point of view and from history's point of view. It can't, it can't, you can't take it away from it. It's like the people who are critics of Begin. You can't take away from Begin what he accomplished. And by the way, that will apply to Netanyahu's legacy. Netanyahu is the longest serving prime minister of Israel. And he's had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. But on balance, when you talk to Israelis, one of the questions they ask is, who would you replace him with? It's a fascinating question. It shows an absence of, of leadership. The Republican Party has the same crisis in this country. How do they replace Donald Trump, who is the driving force of the Republican Party today, for good or for bad? We look to leaders to make a difference. You know who the greatest modern Jewish prophet was? David Ben-Gurion and look at the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, which he was confronted with. And the same thing applies to Golda Meir. Is there anybody out there who didn't love Golda Meir? But, you know, if Golda Meir were alive today and you were reading her positions on a variety of issues, and in your library you have her autobiography and you have Maurice Serkin's uh, uh, interview with her. I know it's there because I've seen it in the Orange County uh, Jewish Community Library. Uh, her, her positions were very clear. If Golda were alive, she'd be thrilled about Jerusalem. She'd be thrilled about the Golan Heights. These are things which were once mainstream views. And well, now if you have another question, I mean, I can go on and on. So I don't believe so, unless someone would like to unmute themselves or is it Jay? Go ahead. Um, I'm just thinking myself, 
that Donald Trump has embraced the ultra right, which is anti-Semitic. I can't come to grips with the fact that he embraces that group and at the same time loves Israel. It's just inconsistent to me. How, how do you reconcile that? I mean, then I say to myself, there's a sense, my sense is there's anti-Semitism there. Well, I remember when Jimmy Carter delivered a Sunday school sermon in which he said the Jews killed Jesus. He stood it as president of the United States at the First Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. And he was called on it by a Christian minister. And I have all the correspondence. I have copies of everything. Uh, all that was overlooked because Jimmy Carter brought about an agreement between Israel and Egypt. So I have to, I have to consider there are right-wing forces that support Donald Trump that hate Jews. May I tell you, when the Charlottesville march took place, Jews will not replace us, I waited for Donald Trump take the stand that I felt he should take. It was what, by the way, Joe Biden says motivated, motivated him to run for president. But you have to be willing, I believe, to give credit where credit is due. Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, Iran, and you can go down a list. There are five or six areas where Donald Trump emerged uh, as a powerful force. Do I condemn his right-wing stuff? You bet. That's why I couldn't vote for him. That's why I didn't vote for him in large measure. But you have to, as I'm doing today, I'm not taking a partisan stand. Please understand. Maybe I should, but this is not a political rally. What I'm doing is I'm articulating the clear points that when history is written, Donald Trump will be viewed as pro-Israel. May I make one other comment to address you directly? Richard Nixon. When I worked for Richard Nixon, he was a villain in the Jewish community, particularly in the Jewish community of Los Angeles, which remembered the Helen Gehagen Douglas campaign of 1950 and the Jury Voorhees campaign of 1946. So in 1973, who saved Israel? Richard Nixon. If Nixon had not ordered that airlift, when he did, Israel would have been destroyed. Don't believe me? Go into your library and read Chaim Herzog's autobiography, or Moshe Dayan, or Golda Meir, or Abba Eben. So I understand the criticisms, but I also understand as an objective historian, or at least I'm trying to be an objective historian. It's not easy when it comes to Donald Trump. Richard Nixon turned out to be one of the most pro-Israel presidents. Wait a minute, Ronald Reagan. Do you remember the concerns? about Ronald Reagan and the Jewish community in California, but very few people remembered something about Reagan. There were only two governors in 1967 who on the eve of the Six Day War bought Israel bonds. Okay, you know one of them was Ronald Reagan. Anybody know who the other one was? Spiro Agnew in Maryland. And who became the most identifiably anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist, but Spiro Agnew who went to the Saudi government for a payoff after he left office because he needed support. So hmm. I'm, I can make the criticisms. I know the history, but I can tell you that in the history of Israel, oh, one more, may I use one other example? Harry Truman. Harry Truman was the best friend Israel ever had in the White House, in my judgment. Yet did you read Harry Truman's comments about Jews? Jesus Christ couldn't please them. How am I supposed to do it? So I, I view this rightly or wrongly because this is about great Americans, and Jewish contributions. We have to use a word when it comes to presidents and that is we have to discriminate. We have to judge them for the positive things they've done and give them credit and the negative things. Uh, Jimmy Carter, not my favorite president, not, never voted for him. But when the history of Israel is written, the Camp David Accords and the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt will rank right up there. And that is the same application. Look, one other quick comment. Think about the two Bushes 
George H. W. Bush, the senior Bush. Jews in America had grave doubts about George H. W. Bush. We didn't like him. We remember the letter that, or the press conference he had, where he talked about that small band of Jews coming up to Capitol Hill. It was a pejorative, and Shoshana, and Shoshana Cardin, who is president of the Conference of Major American Jewish Organizations, wrote a very stiff letter to him about that. And I'm looking here at vote totals. Let me just uh, give you how it was. In, in 1988, Dukakis got 64% of the Jewish vote. Bush got 35%. But in 1992, uh, Jews, only 11% of Jews in America voted for George H.W. Bush. Are you aware of that? People forget. Clinton got 80%, and Ross Perot, God knows why, got 9%. So we have to discriminate. And I'll give you one other example, if I can, about George H.W. Bush. Who encouraged the Aliyah of Beta Yisrael, of what we used to call the Falasha? It was George H.W. Bush, who provided American transport and all the rest to get the Black Jews from Ethiopia to Israel. And, and let me just say a quick word about vice presidents. Uh, do you remember uh, Dan Quayle? People used to say that if he were president, they would quail at the thought. But there was no vice president who worked harder to have the repeal of the Zionism as racism resolution, which was accomplished on uh, December 16th of 1991. And he deserves great credit for that. So you have to balance these things. It's not black and white. It's not all good and all bad. Uh, so I, I, what I'm trying to do, do you understand, if you were at a political rally with me or you were listening to me on KGO and I was trying to be partisan, I could be. What I'm trying to be is objective. What do we want as Jews in America? We want a secure Israel. And to have a secure Israel, we need to have an administration in Washington which supports Israel, may not agree with every stand that the government of Israel takes, but which predominantly is pro-Israel. The only two situations where we had doubts about an American president, Dwight Eisenhower in 1956 during the Suez crisis, when he actually threatened to cut aid to Israel, as many of you will remember, and I could elucidate on that at some length, and uh, George H.W. Bush. And that's the reason George H.W. Bush only got 11% of the Jewish vote. And that's the reason why Adlai Stevenson, uh, well, I don't want to go into the history, but let me just tell you, just be aware there are pros and cons. And we have to live with whatever we have. And so whenever a Jewish organization or a Jewish leader, whatever that means, I'm not sure I know what a Jewish leader is, um, giving a lot of money doesn't make you a leader. It makes you somebody who has influence. And that's another question that, that maybe we could deal with Jerry on another day. What yes. makes a Jewish leader in the United States? Who are the Jewish leaders in the United States? But who are the Jews who really stand for the community? Well, I can tell you, uh, there are some who would say, particularly in Southern California, Dennis Prager. No, I don't think so. Not from my point of view. Uh, so who is the leader the, the one Jew in America who everyone respects. It's a serious question because we don't have what we used to have, which were identifiable Jews in leadership positions who there was a consensus within the Jewish community represented real leadership. That's another weakness in our own community. By the way, it's a, it's a weakness in Israel too. Who will replace Netanyahu? It's going to be a great question. So anyway, okay, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I just want to thank you for giving us so much to be thinking about and really stimulating our thoughts and, and laying out the whole picture for us. I really appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate everybody's participation and questions. Uh, this was very informative. And I just want to thank you so much, John. No, I, will come back. I will come back. I hope you will invite me when I can physically come down to Orange County, really be at the JCC, really participate. And I wanna thank all of you 
I promised Jerry that I would not be divisive, <laughs> that I would try to be objective, that pro-Trump people and anti-Trump people or pro-Biden and anti-Biden would all be able to share equally in this experience. If I have accomplished that goal, may I tell you, I am thrilled. And may I say to everyone, Chag Sameach, have a wonderful Pesach. I just want to give you a little feedback. Irv Chase said, thanks for the wonderful program. Brilliant. So thank you so much. I will tell my wife. <laughs> so thank you again. And everybody have a wonderful evening. And uh, yeah, Passover is coming up. So happy Passover. A decent Pesach, as my husband Amen. just said in the background. Bye, Tom, everybody. Thank you. Thank Have you, Jerry. A pleasure. Good luck. Have a great evening. <laughs>
So I believe in effective mobilization, and that requires the Jewish community to have a hands-on approach. Does that answer in part your question? Yes, it still confounds me though. No, it shouldn't confound you. The left, the pro-BDS, the Palestinian movement is very powerful and very compelling. It doesn't mean they're right, but they mobilize their forces more effectively than we do. And the absence of something like Yipni uh, hurt us terribly. One other criticism, if I can make it. Once upon a time, and I think they still have it in APAC, they have a very active student group, John Kessler, Johnny Kessler, who was also one of my uh, students, if you will. Um, we've ceased to emphasize the need for campus activism. The battle for Israel in this country will be fought in two places, the churches of America and the campuses of America. And where do the pro-Palestinian anti-Israel forces invest their time and energy? Churches and campuses. Uh, we have failed to reach out because we no longer have, particularly in the Christian denominations, the powerfully pro-Israel forces of a Bob Drynan, who was a Roman Catholic, or a Frank Littell, who was a Protestant. We, and we don't even target them anymore. So that's, you heard a Portnoy's complaint? That's Rothman's complaint. And by the way, UC Irvine, the campus ministries should be mobilized. The campus ministries should be mobilized. The young Democrats and the young Republicans at UC Irvine should be mobilized. Speakers should be brought in to talk with them, to work with them. And the Jewish students deserve the support, not only of the Jewish community, but of the campus community. What do campus ethnic groups get in terms of support from the school? Does the Jewish student group at Irvine get that same support? And if not, why not? Because we are more than a religious group. We are an ethnic group with the same rights as any other ethnic group. But we don't think that way, and we should, and I hope we do. I'm always available to consult on something like that on the house because I feel so strongly about it. All right, Ruth, you wanted to say something? In the meantime, he answered my question. Oh, okay. So it's... Great. Thank you Excellent. so much. You, you've Excellent. just given us so much information. Uh, lots to think about. Thank you. I, I wish I could remember all the information. <laughs> and I did send a question about the book that he mentioned early on. Right, sorry, Ruth, you did ask that. And I was trying to figure out which book it was. John, you mentioned a, a book that Ruth was interested in getting. You asked me to remember, you know, the three signs of getting older. The first one is you forget things. And the second one is, um, but I do okay. wanna just remind you of one thing. I was once asked what I thought, what people thought of going to bed with Jerry Falwell who proclaimed himself a Christian Zionist. And my answer was, the question is not whether we go to bed. The question is once we're in bed, how far do we go? And that is, that is the compelling question when you deal with politics. How far do you go? I am willing to work with any Democrat or any Republican who is pro-Israel. And I'm willing to work with any Christian denomination which is pro-Israel because the survival of Israel is the key to the survival of the Jewish people. So I, I boil it down very simply. Thank you. Do you know that it was in God is looking out for us when he makes us forget things? <laughs> because God looked down and said, you know, how can I help these seniors? They're not getting enough exercise. That's why he makes us drop things because then we have to bend down. And why does God make us forget what we went into a room for? And then, um, and then we have to go back again to remember because we don't walk enough. So that's why we have to go back and forth to remember things. Thank you for why does, And why does he make us go to the bathroom so often, middle of the night? 
because in the middle of the night, we get no exercise. <laughs> uh, I used to make the argument that when we were created, God only provided so many heartbeats. Why would I waste heartbeats on exercise? <laughs> All right. Is there anything else I can do? And by the way, I'm always happy to, to answer questions or do anything. I love Orange County and I love the people who are there. Uh, and, and we love having you here. And as soon as we open up, if not before, as soon as we can have a group, because right now it's what, 10%, Julie, that we can allow in? Well, that's for the gym. It's 25%. Oh, 25. Yeah. So um, we will be glad to have you again. Thank so, you. One of these days, John, much. we look yeah. forward to it. Thank yes. you. I appreciate it. It was wonderful. I don't Thank have to you. go to a psychiatrist. I have the Orange County Jewish community. All right. <laughs> Thanks,